Um, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, so my name is Amy Jewett, and uh, I'm the Pennsylvania IMAP Invasives Program Coordinator with Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the PA Natural Heritage Program. Uh, I've been in this role for a little over 10 years now at this point. Um, and uh, so a lot of people know me as the person that does um, the IMAP um, program, but Brian, who's on with us tonight as well, is very active as well. I'll give Brian a chance here to introduce himself. So Brian, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, my name is Brian Daggs, and I'm the invasive plant ecologist at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. So um, I help Amy a lot with the, the IMAP Invasives program, but on top of that, I do a lot of work outside of the program, uh, in general, working on invasive species, uh, whether that is surveying, identifying, or creating plants to manage them in our natural spaces. Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. So Brian's going to be navigating the slideshow tonight, so I'm going to be saying next and next a good bit. Um, so Brian, go ahead and advance for me. Okay, so before we jump into the meat of our presentation tonight, I wanted to take a moment and just briefly go over some of the terminology that we use when we talk about invasive species. And sometimes some of these terms can be used incorrectly or interchangeably with each other when they shouldn't be. And so I just wanted to take a moment and just go over this part um, of things first. And so um, the first definition uh, is native. I think probably most of you are familiar with what we mean by native species, uh, but this is referring to species that occur naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat, and they arrive there without the assistance of people, um, so they got there by themselves or by natural means. Uh, an exotic species is one that has been intentionally or unintentionally introduced by people into an ecosystem where they did not um, naturally evolve. And so an exotic species is not necessarily a nuisance species or invasive, but it can be. Um, so some species are considered a nuisance by us, um, but are not actually invasive. And a really good example of a nuisance species is poison ivy. Um, for those of us, um, including me, that have uh, a sensitivity when we brush up against that plant and get a rash, it's not something that we generally enjoy, but it is actually a PA native plant. And so therefore it is not um, invasive because it is native. Um, it's also a really valuable food source for birds and wildlife. Um, they really enjoy the berries that are produced by poison ivy. Um, and so a true invasive species is one that's actually native to another region or continent and is known to cause harm to the environment, the economy, or human and animal health. So it has that dual duality of being non-native, but also causing harm, whereas those exotic species are just non-native, but are not known to cause any kind of harm. So again, just keep these terms in mind when you're thinking about and talking about invasive species and make sure that you're using those terms uh, correctly. Okay, next, Brian. Okay, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview about IMAP invasives, and then Brian's going to take some time and do some demonstrations to show you guys a bit more uh, detail associated with the platform. So IMAP is a free to use online database that is uh, allows users to record and view invasive species locations as well as management efforts. Um, and this is really helpful because it gives us a good understanding of where invasive species are being found across the state. We don't have to guess at this. We actually have documented information that's telling us that it was found by a particular person on a certain date at a particular location. Uh, the management efforts are also helpful to understand, you know, where some of our professional land managers are doing certain efforts and what those efforts are to try to treat some of the um, invasive species infestations that occur across the state. So here in Pennsylvania, the IMAP program is administered by staff um, by the, at the Western PA Conservancy and the Heritage Program. So Brian and I are some of those staff. There is a few others that are also part of the program as well. Important to note, any observation data or presence information that is submitted to IMAP Invasive, so say you found um, you know, an invasive species somewhere and you submitted that data record to IMAP, 
any data um, that comes in like that is always expert vetted. And we do that to ensure that the species IDs are correct and the records are mapped appropriately as well. Um, so certainly, you know, we we are not perfect. We make mistakes too, but on the whole, you can pretty much trust the data that is in IMAP Invasives. Um, other platforms like iNaturalist are are wonderful, but um, that that information is not expert vetted the way that um, the information in IMAP is. So you really can um, definitely trust the data that we are providing. We do have some mobile apps that are available to collect data in IMAP invasives while you're out in the field. So you don't have to take um, a pen and paper with you and jot down things that way. You can actually um, collect data right while you're out hiking along a trail. If you're a boater and you like to be out on the water and you find an aquatic plant that's invasive, you can capture that data on uh, your phone um, using one of our apps. And that's really convenient for a lot of people. So if you'd like to learn more about IMAP after our training tonight, you can go to imapinvasives.org, which is our national website, or the Pennsylvania Specific Programs website, which is paimapinvasives.org. Next. So there's a few components that are really important to know regarding IMAP. Um, number one, good photos are super critical when you're um, submitting presence information for where you're finding invasive species. Um, I will show some examples here in a little bit about um, concerning what I mean by a good photo. But in general, it's a photo of a species that's taken up close. Um, it's clear and crisp, and it's showing the distinguishing characteristics of a species. Um, and so again, I will show some examples of that here in a little bit. In addition to presence information, IMAP also allows its users to record not detected, or you can think of it as absence information. Uh, and that information can be really valuable. So for example, if uh, a group is doing a survey for early detection invasive species, so ones that are not commonly found in the state or are not here yet, it may be really helpful to know that those species were searched for in a certain area and just not found. And so you can document that information by creating a not detected record in IMAP. Uh, as I mentioned, you can record treatment information in IMAP. Uh, mainly that is utilized by our professional land managers and natural resource professionals. Um, and so again, that's helpful to have a better understanding of where particular management efforts are happening um, across the state. And in particular, what are they doing? Are they doing some kind of physical, um, like a hand pooling effort? Are they using a chemical to control a species? Are they using a biocontrol? That can be really helpful. It's sort of like an information sharing to say, hey, this is what someone did to manage this species. Maybe you could use this same um, method as well because it worked for us kind of thing. Also, IMAP allows users to set up email alerts. Um, and this is a really nice customizable resource that allows you to stay up to date on particular invasive species that might be of interest to you, or perhaps an area of interest like a local park or natural area. And you can know right away if something um, is being found there um, just by having an email sent to uh, your email account. And then finally, if you're interested in digging a little bit uh, more deeply into what IMAP has to offer, it does provide different types of reports that you can create and allows you to export that data out of the database. And you can create spreadsheets, you can create maps, you can do other things with that data um, as you like. Next, please. So here's a few examples of what I was talking about earlier about good photos. Uh, again, keeping in mind, these are all um, photographs that are up close to the species that's being observed. That's really important. Um, they're all very clear and crisp. We can see the details of these species in these pictures. And the other thing that's really helpful here, and at least a few of them, is the observer included something to help show scale or the size of the plant or animal that they were observing. So if you look at the photo on the left, which is Eurasian water milfoil, that person actually took that plant out of the water, put it into a separate container that had some clear water that you can easily see the leaflets. And then they also, also included a ruler. So you can get a good sense of how large that particular species is. The middle photo is giant knotweed, and you can see that person purposely included their hand 
in that image because they wanted to show the size of that leaf and show how big it is because that's one of the distinguishing characteristics of uh, giant knotweed. And then the photo on the right, if you're curious, is uh, jumping worms. Uh, next, please. So these are some examples of not so good photos to take. Um, so the photo on the left is obviously taken from a distance. I'm assuming that the person was looking at those purple flowers that are in that little marshy area. Uh, they might be purple loosestrife, which is an invasive plant, and they might not. At this distance, it's pretty impossible to say. And so unless a record included a more up-close image of those plants, it would be impossible for us to know for sure what that is. And likely that record in the database would have to get removed because we were not able to make a confirmation of that. So keeping in mind, you wanna be up close to your target species. The species here on the right, that person was very up close, but the problem there is their camera was focused on the background rather than the species in the foreground, which is mile and minute vine. So again, just slowing down, making sure that your camera is focusing on what you want it to focus on is very critical when you're, when you're ca um, capturing data for IMAP invasives. Uh, next, please. So this is a table that briefly outlines um, the different functionality that's available in our IMAP Invasives online database as compared to our mobile applications. So if you're looking just at the database column, you can see that the database can do everything. Uh, it can you know, be used to create data, um, the different data types, and it can also be used to view species distributions. You can create those reports and do um, data exports and create email alerts as well. The main difference between the database and the apps is the apps are used for data collection only. You cannot use them to view species uh, distributions or any of the other tools like what the database can do. Um, the nice part about the apps though is because is, is that they can be used without an internet connection. You can be in a very remote area and have no trouble using these apps. Uh, whereas the online database does need to be somewhere where you have that Wi-Fi connection. Um, in comparing the mobile app to the Survey123 app, again, this, these are things that Brian's going to go a little bit more into detail on, um, but the classic mobile app is a more simplified version of a data collection tool, so it can record presence and not detected information, cannot record treatment information, and it can only do point information. It cannot do like a large polygon. Survey123, it can do everything. It can provide you with that extra functionality if that's what you're looking for. So just keep in mind some of these things when you're in the field and you're trying to collect information. These are the things to keep in mind as far as what tool you might want to use. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. It is lagging a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Brian. I didn't know if I lost you there for a second. Okay. Um, so our website, this is a, a screenshot of the homepage of our website, paimapinvasives.org. And if you're interested in um, getting a login account or checking things out, you can go there to the top where it says login or register. Uh, next, please, Brian. And when you click on either of those buttons, it will take you here to this page. If you have an existing IMAP Invasives account, you can sign in with your email address and password. And if you're new to IMAP Invasives and you don't already have an account, you can fill in this sign up form here and that will get you set up. Okay, and next. Okay, I guess this is start the your start of your um, part, Brian. So take it away. Yep. So uh, so now that Amy's given us an overview of IMAP invasives, it'd be good to take a look at how uh, how to actually interact with some of these things. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the classic mobile app, uh, which I'm going to show on my phone, uh, and then we're going to get a general overview of the online database uh, here on my desktop and use that to view uh, some of the data that exists. And let me just connect my phone really quickly. Uh, 
Okay, do we see that, Amy? Yes, I see that, Brian. Awesome. So here I have um, the, the app titled IMAP app. That is our classic mobile app, which as Amy mentioned, is a simplified data collection tool. Also on my screen here is the Survey123, which allows for a more advanced data collection tool. Um, but today we're just gonna take a look at the classic mobile app. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. And on this home screen here, it starts you off with a, a nice little welcome home screen that explains where all of the different things are. Uh, but I'm gonna go through that uh, myself. So I just tap the screen once to make that go away. Um, first thing to note is in the top left uh, is your menu. This, uh, this will come in handy later when uh, uploading records that we've collected, but uh, we also need it to set the preferences. So on that menu list, there are preferences there. We open that up and that's where you enter your IMAP Invasive's login information so that the records you collect with the app are attached to your account. Uh, in here, you can choose a few other preferences. Um, so for the species list in the app, you can choose whether or not you wanna see scientific and common names for each species. Um, you can set your picture quality. Uh, if you don't wanna take up a bunch of space on your phone storage, you can set the quality to 50 percent and uh, it'll take up less space uh, while reducing the overall picture quality overall. Um, as well as a few other options to set uh, things like your measurement system, whether you want to do uh, feet and acres versus meters and hectares. Um, and if you want to attach your observations to any particular project or organization that we have set up in the in the database. So I'm just going to go back. I don't need to edit any of that. Uh, and let's go ahead and create an observation. So in the top right of the app is the add observation button. And I'm just gonna click that. And so what we're met with are a few options to start collecting data. Um, we have the option of taking a photo with our phone's camera or selecting a photo that already exists in our phone's library. If you happen to have already taken a picture of the species you're looking to upload. Um, I'm just going to take a photo real quick of my computer screen to use as an example. And wow, that is trippy, huh? And so there, I just took a photo, pretending I just took a photo of an invasive species that I'd like to upload. Uh, next is the is the drop down list. So I select the list, and it brings up our entire list of species. Right now, you have to scroll through the list to find the species you want to make a record of. Uh, I know that in the future, this is looking to be changed so that you can just start typing in the name of the species and it'll pop up so that you don't have to scroll through. And instead you can just search. Uh, since we're just doing an example, I'm gonna go back to the top and select a fake species for testing purposes. Uh, next is to label that as species detected or species not detected. So this is what Amy was talking about earlier when she said that you can uh, on top of taking presence records for species that you see, you can also take records for species that you searched for but didn't find and are thus presumably absent from the area you're looking in. I'm going to go ahead and select species detected here. When you open up a new record, when you add an observation, it automatically collects your GPS point. Right now, we have a bit of a bug going on where the map doesn't uh, display correctly, which uh, will hopefully get fixed soon. Um, if the map did display correctly, you'd be able to grab that pin and drag it if you didn't want your point to be directly where you're standing. Um, the next is all sorts of optional fields that you can fill in if you want, but aren't required to. Uh, it lets you take, do things like time search. So how much time did you spend searching for the species you're recording? Uh, for example, I can input and say that I spent five minutes looking for the fake species that I'm uploading. Uh, it lets you pick the size of the area, and this is very simplified going from, you know, 10 square feet up to, uh, you know, more than an acre. And, um, and you might be surprised or you might not that some species infestations, especially some plants, can take up way more than a single acre. Uh, in this instance, I'm just going to select up to 10 square feet. Uh, it also lets you choose one of these categories for distribution. You, you can label species as being trace or sparse and scattered, or perhaps occurring as a big dense clump or bush or something of that nature. I'll just select trace here. And, and then finally, you have a text box 
if you want to add any extra observations, uh, like I can say observed in my home office. And then after that, you filled out all your things and press save. So now uh, back on your home screen, you have your list of observations, or in my case, just the one. Uh, once you're ready to upload, which I typically recommend doing it over Wi-Fi, um, press the check mark right there. And now that record is selected. We go back to our menu in the top left. And I have the option to either upload the selected records or delete the selected records uh, for any reasons if I thought, you know, maybe I made that record by mistake or the ID is wrong and it was actually a native species, uh, whatever. Um, here, I'm confident that this is a fake species for testing purposes, so I'm going to feel okay uploading that record. Press OK on the next page. Uh, let it think for a second to upload that and successful. Uh, and now it tells you to visit IMAP3 online and log in to view your uploaded records. Uh, what it's referring to there is our web map, our online database. So let me stop sharing my phone screen and now bring us to the online database here. So this is what it looks like when you log in or well, not quite. When you log in, you're way more zoomed out and it looks like this, uh, where all of the presence records are represented by these uh, orange circles of varying size based on abundance of records within one of these hexagon grids that are superimposed over the map. Um, but uh, I'm going to zoom in to Pittsburgh because that's where I am and that's where I'd like to see some data. Um, off on the right hand side are a bunch of options for layers and other things that you can add to uh, change the data that you're seeing or supplement it. Uh, so for example, you can change your base map. If I don't like this topographic map, I can click on maybe the satellite and I'd maybe I'd rather see it in a satellite view. Um, there is an option to add layers from URL, which is a bit more of an advanced feature that uh, would come in helpful if you're someone who works with GIS and has GIS polygons that you'd like to superimpose over the map. Uh, and maybe that's a, more of a functionality that a lot of land managers and natural resource professionals would use. Um, we can add a distribution layer um, and we'll show examples of this later on in the PowerPoint after we're done looking at the web map to show you what those look like but you can add distribution layers that will highlight a feature such as a county, or you can use water bodies uh, or municipal boundaries even to show where invasive species have been found. Uh, and then down here is to show all of the data layers that we have for invasive species. Right now, I only have confirmed presences turned on. That is all of the presences in the database that have been reviewed by an expert and their identity has been confirmed. Uh, we can also turn on unconfirmed records, which might take a second to load, but there we see them. There are these pinkish circles on the map. These are records that have been uploaded but haven't been reviewed yet by an expert. We have approximate data, which there's often a lot of approximate data. It'll take a second to load, but they show up as blue triangles or large blue circles. And that approximate data, um, that approximate data is data whose geographic accuracy uh, may not be so great. So uh, there are often records, usually older records, where someone observed it and said, oh, it's in this area, but they didn't have precise coordinates. So we label those as approximate. Um, we have our not detected records. So anywhere where someone deliberately looked for a species and didn't find it, those show up as these yellow polygons or sometimes yellow circles. So someone, I guess, searched the entire Allegheny River here and didn't find what they were looking for. Uh, and then we have our treatment records, which uh, I don't know that we'll see them. We had, hasn't been used too much yet, but these show up as brown polygons on the map to indicate that someone did something to treat or remove uh, some kind of invasive species. Uh, like I believe Amy mentioned earlier, that could be chemical control, physical removal or a release of a biocontrol agent. And we do see some treatment records on the map there, nice. Uh, and then lastly, there are these searched areas. These are 
kind of underlining uh, polygons that are attached to all of their records. Uh, and they pretty much serve as like a surveyed area polygon. So for every point, there's um, usually a buffered circle around it that serves as the, the surveyed area. And with more advanced data collection methods, you can draw large polygons like this. You can draw large served area, searched areas to represent uh, maybe a larger, more widespread survey. Um, and one of the neat things that we have is actually iNaturalist data. If you're familiar with iNaturalist, it is, a, it is a somewhat similar platform where people view things in the natural world. They take records for organisms and upload it to a community database. And so iNaturalist actually feeds us the past five years of invasive species data to show up on our map. Uh, and that shows up as these pink triangles. So, and you can see uh, all those pink triangles are data coming from iNaturalist that uh, they've, uh, they've been able to provide to us. Um, and then down here, you have things like geographic map layers, uh, things uh, you can turn on to state boundaries, county boundaries, any kind of political boundaries. You can highlight water bodies. Uh, and several other kinds of things here. I encourage you to play with these and see what kind of things you can uh, show on the map. Um, and that is it. These are these are things that I can see because I'm an admin. Ignore this. Um, yeah. So if I turn on unconfirmed present species and I zoom in, I bet the record that I uploaded moments ago is already in here. It should be this. If I click on that and look at that, a fake species for testing by Brian Daggs, I wonder who that is. And I open that, and this is what a record looks like uh, on the web map. So you open it up, it has the photo that you took, uh, it has all of these things that I added, the comments I made, um, the area that I said it occupied, and the little distribution designation. It's even tagged to the project that I tagged it to. Uh, and then from here, uh, an expert will eventually get to this and look at it. They'll look at the pictures and, uh, and they'll confirm that the record is legit. Um, since this is a record for testing purposes and doesn't contain any real information, uh, I will delete that later on. And that is a pretty general overview. There are other there are tools like filtering if you want to say see only records you've uploaded or you're interested in records that a single person has uploaded. If you want to see records for only a single species, you can filter that. Say, I only want to see Japanese knotweed and apply that filter. Uh, and there are all sorts of other filters you can apply. Um, if you're ever curious, I really encourage, you know, play around with these and see what kind of distributions you can see from the data that already exists. Uh, and some of it might be interesting. Uh, let's see if we have any Japanese knotweed and look at, uh, and that has to end, look at that. All of the Japanese knotweed records around Pittsburgh are filtered out. Uh, everything else we don't see, and we only see the stuff we are interested in. Um, so that is a really uh, general overview of the functionalities of here. Um, I think what we're going to get into next is some species. Uh, we return to our PowerPoint from current slide. Uh, and this is just to show you again, uh, all the symbology for the data uh, and some specific definitions for some of it. I don't need to go into it in too much detail, I think, but uh, it's nice to include uh, for reference, especially since the, this is being recorded. Uh, if you ever want to go back through and get clarity on what we mean by some of these data layers, you know, what does it mean uh, for a presence to be approximate or unconfirmed? Or, you know, what do they mean by a searched area, for example? Um, and we do have uh, additional trainings on all of these tools um, on our YouTube, which uh, I don't know it exactly, Amy will be able to tell you, but we have uh, additional more in-depth trainings for using the mobile app as well as using the survey one, two, three, if we're ever interested in uh, a more detailed data collection method. Um, Amy, if there are no other notes on that, I think we can get into highlighting a few species. Yeah, that, that sound sounds good? good. Yeah. 
So um, it should come as no surprise that there are dozens and dozens of species out there that uh, we consider invasive, and a lot of them have become very common. Uh, here on the screen, we have listed out, you know, uh, a ton of examples, and we definitely don't have time to go over all of them. So uh, let's highlight some ones that uh, we, we feel to be pretty impactful and important to look at. Um, and I think Amy's going to go first here looking at knotweeds, lesser celandine, and red-eared slider. Hey, thanks, Brian. So uh, yeah, I want to talk first about invasive knotweeds. Um, so there are more than one type of invasive knotweed. I think a lot of us might be familiar with the Japanese uh, knotweed, but there are some other types out there uh, as well. So um, for those of you that are already familiar with this species, you know that it is capable of quickly forming some very dense stands that become these monocultures uh, over time. And they ultimately will crowd out native vegetation. If you look at the image here on the slide, this woman is standing next to a giant knotweed patch. Uh, nothing else is gonna be able to grow there. It's just so thick. Uh, and very dense and, and anything that might have been there before, like a, <clears throat> a native species is not going to be able to grow there much longer, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just because of that really thick uh, vegetation that will grow there. So those stands of knotweed, if they're in some uh, riparian areas, can actually clog small waterways, displace streamside vegetation, which might be some of our important native species. Um, it will promote bank erosion, which is not good, and it lowers the quality of that riparian habitat for, <clears throat> for fish and wildlife. And so once uh, an area is established that has knotweed in it, that knotweed is very difficult to eradicate. It is possible, but it is very, very difficult and time consuming, and it takes multiple years um, of intense treatment in order to really knock that back. Um, so knotweed can be found in a lot of different types of locations. Um, so it can be found in those riparian corridors like streams and rivers. It can be found along railroads and utility rights of ways, and also in some more harsher um, environments like ditches, vacant lots, um, and waste places. It is a very hardy species. Um, I should have included a picture of this, but I forgot to. But knotweed is actually able to grow up through pavement. Um, believe it or not, that is true. I'm not making that up. You can Google it. Um, and so this is one that it is very hardy and it can definitely establish in some places that most species cannot. Uh, next, please. Uh, so here's a nice guide to help in distinguishing between the different types of species uh, of knotweed. I'm going to talk about the first three, the giant knotweed, bohemian knotweed, and Japanese knotweed. Um, so looking at giant knotweed, we can see just by leaf size that generally that's always going to have the largest leaves out of the three. Um, you'll also notice that at the base of the giant knotweed leaf, it's more of a heart shape as compared to the bohemian and the Japanese knotweed that has more of a flat bottom on it. If you skip over to the Japanese knotweed leaf, that is typically going to be the smaller of uh, size leaves, but leaf size and shape is not always um, a good indicator of a species because the leaves will the leaves will vary. Um, but in general, that's going to be a little bit smaller. The Bohemian knotweed is a hybrid of the giant and Japanese knotweed, and that's kind of in between as far as the leaf size. The other characteristics are all a little bit similar. Um, so sometimes it can be difficult to know for sure what species of knotweed you're looking at. And as far as IMAP goes, we do have the ability to record just knotweed species, species unknown in the database if you're not sure what species of knotweed you're looking at. And then we can have an expert take a look at your images and know for sure what that might have been. Next, please. So knotweed is very prevalent in Pennsylvania. As you can see, it's taking up most of the state. Likely the counties that are not highlighted here on this map probably have it, and we just don't have the records to show for it. So if you're in any of those counties anytime this year and you're seeing some knotweed, 
uh, do us a favor and record a few records. That way we can help to fill in our map a little bit more. Uh, but this is a species, as I mentioned, very hardy. Um, it can grow in so many different places and it is very invasive. Next, please. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about these species, uh, the, knot, the knotweed species, if you're not already familiar with it, there is a great resource available from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, DCNR. And if you scan the QR code here, it will take you right to that resource on your phone. You can also just Google for this uh, resource by typing in um, DCNR um, Japanese and giant knotweed, and it should come up that way um, as well. Next, please. So the next species I'm going to talk about is lesser celandine. Uh, this is a species that is very aggressive and typically emerges a little bit earlier than most of our native species. Um, it's a problem because it will easily displace uh, our native spring ephemerals because it creates this very thick carpet of vegetation. And you can see that perfectly in that first image there uh, on the left side. It just really overtakes everything. Uh, and if you wouldn't know it's an invasive, you would think that, you know, it's actually very beautiful and maybe it should be there. But in fact, uh, it, it is invasive and that that plant should not be there in that forest understory. Um, and so it becomes a problem not only by displacing these native species, but then that has a domino effect by impacting our native pollinators, which rely on having those spring ephemerals for nectar and pollen um, during a time when other food sources are typically very scarce. Um, and so where you can find it is typically in places like forested floodplains, um, also in low open woods, in meadows, and also along roadsides and waste places. Uh, it does prefer to be in moist alluvial soils and less frequently it will also be found in some drier places as well. Next, please. So I mentioned that uh, lesser celandine will overtake areas where some of our um, spring ephemerals and native wildflowers would typically be. Here is just a few examples of some of those, and you can see they're quite stunning and beautiful. We have common blue violet, Virginia spring beauty, and yellow trout lily. These are the flowers that are not only beautiful to look at, but they're very important for our pollinators as well. So anytime you have lesser celandine take over an area, it's probably out competing species like this. And so that's something that we don't want to have happen. We certainly want to make sure that our spring ephemerals are going to stick around um, and be able to thrive in the environments where they're typically found in. Next, please. So here's a distribution map for lesser celandine in Pennsylvania, according to the data that we have. Uh, in IMAP invasive, certainly not as prevalent as knotweed, thankfully, but it is still in um, a good many of our counties, uh, including in that Philadelphia region where you guys are located. Next, please. Here's another resource also from DCNR talking specifically about lesser celandine. If you'd like to check this out, there is that QR code that you can scan with your phone. Or again, you can just uh, look up this um, resource by Googling Lesser Celandine and DCNR, and it should come up pretty quickly for you. Next, please. And then the last species that I'm going to talk about before I hand things back over to Brian is a type of turtle called a red-eared slider. Um, this turtle is a very aggressive species. It's known to feed on a lot of different things like fish, plants, insects, amphibians and other aquatic organisms and their eggs. And so when it um, has such a large and voracious appetite, uh, it will directly compete with many of our native aquatic and terrestrial turtles um, for food, basking areas, and nesting sites. And so this is not good. It's competing with our native species and that we don't want that to happen. Uh, it also can survive and reproduce in polluted waters, and that makes them prone to contracting and spreading different diseases. I will mention, I didn't put this on my slide here, but some of you might um, recognize red-eared sliders as um, something that people will actually get as pets. They're very popular. People still will go out and purchase them and keep them uh, in home aquariums. But the problem then becomes that when the turtle gets um, too big that it outgrows its aquarium, people don't know what to do with them. And so they think that it's okay to go and release them into a nearby pond or other waterway so that they don't have to kill the, to, to the excuse me, they don't have to kill the turtle. 
Um, and that is not a good thing. Um, when you're releasing an exotic invasive species like this into a waterway, you're actually doing the native species that are normally there a disservice because we can see uh, these species certainly um, do a lot of trouble in our natural environments. Um, so places where you might find a red eared slider um, include quiet waters such as ponds and wetlands, but they also can be found inhabiting slow moving waterways as well. And they can frequently be seen basking on rocks, logs, vegetation, masses, and banks. Next, please. <laughs> okay, um, so here's a distribution map for red eared slider. This is again data being sourced from IMAP invasives, and you can see that it is, um, there are many findings for this species across Pennsylvania. Uh, my hunch is that a lot of these records probably are from um, uh, pet releases, people putting uh, their, their red-eared sliders out into the environment after having them as pets. I don't know that for sure, but that's just a guess. Uh, next, please. And again, another resource for you to check out if you'd like to learn more about red eared sliders, if you're not already familiar with them. Uh, this is a fact sheet provided by Pennsylvania Sea Grant, again, available online. Next, please. Okay, Brian, I'll turn things over to you. Okay, so I'd like to go over some species that uh, we would consider early detection, or we might also call them potential or emerging species, species that aren't widespread in the state or in a region, but uh, are known to have uh, very invasive qualities and could show up and increase, uh, you know, in the coming years. And uh, like the common species, there are a lot that could potentially start to take over. And maybe you've started seeing some of these in your area already. Um, again, we only have so much time, so I'd like to highlight a few of them. That is beech leaf disease, uh, the New Zealand mud sail, and pond water starwort. So when we think of invasive species, usually plants and animals, often insects, or you know, herps like the red-eared slider come to mind. But uh, diseases and pathogens can also be invasive. Uh, there could be parts of the world where that pathogen is native and it gets introduced somewhere else and becomes a massive issue. And that is the case with the beech leaf disease. Um, so beech leaf disease is a pathogen impacting beech trees. That is the genus Fagus. Uh, we have one beech species. It is the American beech uh, Fagus grandifolia. And it is a major component of our canopies in our, in our native forest ecosystems. Um, and the symptoms of beech leaf disease are strongly associated with a newly described, uh, newly discovered um, nematode uh, subspecies uh, whose scientific name I'm not going to try to pronounce. It's quite a mouthful. Um, but the disease causes the leaves of beech trees to discolor and wilt, which reduces their ability to photosynthesize and ultimately provide themselves sustenance. Uh, after many years of being infected, this disease will cause beech trees to ultimately perish. Um, so you can see in the images there, that is an electron micro micro microscopy image of the nematode that carries the beech leaf disease. Uh, and then showing the damage done to the leaves, how it's starting to discolor and wilt. And the, uh, the photo on the right is a beech dominated canopy. And you can look up and start to see all the discoloration in the leaves as all of these trees have been infected. So beech leaf disease is gonna be found where beech trees are found. Uh, mature trees are typically found in upland forests. Like I said, they're a major part of our forest communities. Um, seedlings and younger trees uh, may also be found in more successional forests, so forests that are a bit younger, as well as woodlands that maybe have more scattered tree growth. Um, so we don't have great beech leaf disease data in IMAP yet. Uh, fortunately, there's you know, a nice um, collaborative effort uh, between uh, the province of Ontario, Cleveland Metro Parks, and the U.S. Forest Service to not only track where beech leaf is beech leaf disease has been found, but also where it's been found over the years. Uh, so it start, got its start in Ohio near Lake Erie, and has since spread and has been found in every county in Pennsylvania, aside from those two in the bottom left. Uh, and very recently, uh, within the past two years, has shown up in southeastern Pennsylvania. 
Um, if you want to know more, uh, the U.S. Forest Service has this great document that details a lot of information. There's a great QR code. You can also simply Google, you know, beech leaf disease U.S. Forest Service, and you will find it. Um, the next one I'd like to highlight is the New Zealand mud snail. Um, a lot of the uh, invasive snails that get the most attention are the mystery snails, which are these very large snails that um, you almost can't miss if they're present in a pond. Um, what you can miss are these New Zealand mud snails. These are these very tiny sized snails that uh, you can see in the picture next to a penny are almost impossible to tell the difference between you know, the tiniest pebble uh, in a little water body versus that snail. Um, so these snails can persist as super high dense colonies that will compete with native aquatic invertebrates uh, for food in space. Uh, in some places, they've been found at densities of up to 300,000 snails per square meter. That is a lot packed into a small area. So these snails feed on organic detritus and living algae uh, and consumption of organic matter and the subsequent production of waste pro of you know waste products by the New Zealand mud snails uh, can end up profoundly altering the nutrient cycling and water quality of an aquatic system on top of all the comp competition for food that they create for the native species. Um, you can find New Zealand mud snails uh, in any kind of aquatic habitat, including lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, uh, like the picture on the bottom right, which uh, actually comes from an IMAP invasives record in southeast Pennsylvania shows all of these New Zealand mud snails that were hiding underneath this rock and this user had to flip over that rock in order to actually see them. They often thrive in very disturbed waters that are high in nutrients. Uh, the high nutrients uh, provides uh, abundant algal growth which is their favorite food. Uh, and there's a nice uh, little close-up of all of the snails under that rock. See how tiny they are compared to the user's hand. Uh, here is a distribution. Uh, it's much more patchy compared to um, a lot of the common species we see. Um, there's been some found in northwest, in the center, in the southeast of the state, but it's all erotic and kind of depends on, um, you know, specific water bodies or watersheds where they found. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant has a uh, a great um, fact sheet out, uh, you can scan the QR or simply Google PAC grant New Zealand mud snail and you will uh, find that as well. Uh, lastly, what I'd like to highlight is pond water starwort, which is uh, one that I actually know has been reported from uh, the Wissahickon watershed before. Uh, this is one that would often get overlooked, especially if it's not a, a large infestation yet, but um can become quite problematic. So pond water starwort is this little aquatic plant that creates these dense mats of floating leaves. These leaves are oppositely arranged and they have a wide range of shapes from these kind of long ovular to more roundish oval shaped uh, or circular shaped leaves. Um, so they create these dense mats of floating leaves that can completely cover the surface of a water body such as a pond or a very slow moving creek. Uh, and this will cause them to outcompete the native vegetation. Uh, that dense colony uh, right on the surface of the water could end up altering the flow of a slow moving water body or completely cover a water body that would naturally be open, uh, that would let light through to the bottom. Uh, so you could find this, like I mentioned, in the shallows or stagnant and slow moving water bodies of ponds, lakes, uh, some streams, uh, and especially man-made water bodies like ditches and canals, uh, this would happily take over. And this species is commonly sold as a freshwater aquarium plant. So um, uh, folks like myself who keep fish tanks and like to have live plants in them will often purchase this plant. And uh, some of those folks, instead of disposing of their plants properly, will throw them out into their natural areas where they become issues like this. This one is a bit more all over the place, but pretty well concentrated in Southeast Pennsylvania, which uh, probably just has to do with higher populations. You have more people in that area who would buy the plant and subsequently release it um, on, by accident or on purpose. Uh, 
if you'd like to know more, again, this is uh, uh, pages from the Mid-Atlantic um, Aquatic Invasives uh, Field Guide. Um, you, sh uh, you should be able to look this up. It's a whole, uh, you can find it as a PDF and there might be a print version that uh, highlights tons of aquatic invasive species. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, Amy, is this you? Yeah, I'll take over. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so the field guide that Brian just so showed that resource for the pond water starwort is actually coming, I believe, from this field guide there on the right, that mid-Atlantic field guide to aquatic invasive species. So all three of these field guides are actually available both in print version, but also online as well. We've included a lot of QR codes here tonight, and here's a few more for you. You can scan any of those QR codes and it will take you directly to those particular field guides. Um, you can also probably do some Googling and find them as well, but that's a quick way to access them. Uh, I would definitely recommend checking these out if you haven't um, seen or used these already. They're really excellent resources. Um, the, the field guide on the left, that plan invaders of mid-Atlantic natural areas is primarily talking about terrestrial based species whereas the other two are more focused on the aquatics. The, the um, middle field guide there, uh, as we can see, has Pennsylvania in the title, so that's going to be focused primarily just on Pennsylvania species. And then the field guide on the right has more of a regional um, uh, look to it by focusing on the mid-Atlantic region. Next, please. So just coming back to IMAP Invasives and our website, uh, I would encourage you to check that out when you get a chance. There's a lot of really cool things on there that have more information. Uh, next, please, Brian. So, for example, we do have several upcoming events. We have some webinars that you can still register for. If you're interested, you can check out our events page and see those coming up. One is actually scheduled for next Wednesday, the 10th. Brian and myself and one other person will be talking about some early detection invasive species. Uh, there's another webinar that's going to be talking specifically about managing European water chestnut. And then we have another uh, event coming up that's going to be providing training to help folks get out and do some surveying on their own for um, some specific invasives. So more details about all of those events are on our website. We do have a blog that uh, shares some really cool stories about people that are doing work with invasives, they're doing uh, specific research, um, and most of those stories are focused on people um, in Pennsylvania specifically. We do have a part of our website that's called Be on the Lookout that is highlighting our early detection invasive species. Um, so those are species that either are not yet in Pennsylvania, but are in nearby areas or their species that are not super prevalent yet um, and we want to keep them that way and so it's good to be vigilant um, and know about those species so that if we spot them we can report them um, and hopefully get some management going. We do also have a section of our website that categorizes the different species that we track. Currently we do track over 400 invasive species in our database. And so if you wanna learn a little bit more about what those species are, we have them categorized on our website. So you can go and look at all of the terrestrial plants, um, all of the insects, all the mammals, um, all of the wetland species. We do also have lists of the current um, Pennsylvania noxious weeds that will actually take you directly to the Department of Agriculture's website, um, the fish and boat banned species and such. So if you're curious to check those out, again, that's all um, on our website. We have another page that um, I think this is really cool. We have, it's called Invasive Here But Not There. And it highlights different invasive species that are actually native to parts of Pennsylvania, but also invasive in other parts of it. So these are the species that kind of break the rules that are not necessarily all bad because they are technically native in some parts of our state. And so it's important to keep that in mind um, so that if it, you're finding a certain species in its native range that you're not uh, actually reporting that species to IMAP. Um, we do have what's called the Gallery of Invaders. This is a section of our website that highlights particular species. It shows pictures of them and gives more information. 
And then finally, we do have a training archives area. Uh, we've done many trainings in the past, and a lot of those have been recorded, so you can certainly check those out, um, too, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about our program. Next, please. Okay, so this is our final slide before we wrap things up. So we just wanted to provide you all with some suggested next steps of what you can do now that you are super knowledgeable about IMAP invasives and some of the common and early detection species that are impacting where you guys are from there in the Philly area. So one thing is I would encourage you to search for one or, one or more of the common invasive species, either that we highlighted here tonight or was on that big list um, that Brian showed um, during our presentation. And if you find one of those common invasive species, record your findings, either using the common, or I'm sorry, the classic mobile app or our survey one, two, three. Again, we do have some YouTube videos that are available online that you can check those out and get a little bit more um, familiar with how to use those apps on your phone. You can also set up and customize an email alert in IMAP Invasives, and that will notify you about one or more invasive species that might be found in an area near you or maybe a local natural area that you frequent. Certainly, there is a lot of invasive species out there, and it's hard to be familiar with all of them. So I would encourage you to choose a small number of invasive species that might be new to you. Uh, use one of those field guides that we highlighted here tonight and just do a little reading, um, you know, maybe one, one species a day and just get to know some of these species a little bit better. And that's how we start to recognize them um, when we're out in some of our natural areas is because we've already done the research and we've seen images and we know a little bit about how to identify these species. So I would encourage you to, um, you know, do a little homework and get to know some species you might not already be familiar with. And as I mentioned, we do have some upcoming events that are already scheduled uh, and some that are not yet scheduled, but will be happening later this year also. We always post those on the events section of our website. So I would encourage you to go there, uh, check those out and you, you can register directly for those um, events from our website. And I think Brian, you can go to the last slide. And that should be everything. So uh, on behalf of Brian and myself, again, I just want to say thanks to everyone um, for coming tonight, for sticking with us here till the end. Um, and I think we have some time, hopefully, to take any questions that may have come through on the chat or any other questions that folks might have. So thank you. Thank you so much. I learned. I learned a lot too. Um, so we had, we have a few questions in the chat and folks feel free to drop more in the chat if you want to. Um, so Frank has a few backyard um, problem species, <laughs> including the lesser celandine, um, as well as creeping buttercup and star of Bethlehem. So any tips on how to remove these and also what to replace in, you know, once they're removed? Yeah, so it's how to remove them depends on how, how bad they are, I guess. Um, if you've got like super dense uh, infestations, especially of lesser celandine, um, Removing it is going to be very tough without any kind of herbicide application. But uh, if if you think that it's a it's a manageable sized patch, uh, I would strongly encourage that you simply dig them up. So lesser celandine has kind of an underground tuber to it. They're these really tiny potato looking things, and as long as those come up out of the ground and are discarded, it won't regenerate. Um, as far as replacing it, I would look into, you know, what kinds of spring ephemeral uh, wildflowers are native to your area. Um, as a general rule, I think things like Virginia bluebells are really great to plant. They're a native one that's also sort of aggressive. So uh, if you give it a head start, it'll, it might be able to compete with the lesser celandine uh, accompanied with a bit of management. And, and I would just add to that, that you want to make sure that you are IDing that species correctly. It does have at least one native lookalike, our marsh marigold. 
Um, there are obviously differences between the two, but if um, you're not taking a close look, you might mistake one for the other. So just make sure that you are identifying that correctly. And if you'd like to send a photo to Brian or myself, um, we'd be happy to take a, a second look at that. So folks also mentioned Creeping Buttercup, Star of, and Star of Bethlehem. Um, actually, while we're on the subject of celandine, someone asked if marsh marigold would spread so widely as a celandine. Uh, no, marsh marigold uh, is pretty, uh, it does look a bit like lesser celandine, but it's a lot more restricted to areas that are very swampy and have a bit of you know, standing water to it. Um, whereas lesser cell and dying is a bit more flexible in where it'll establish. So then creeping buttercup, I think was the next species mentioned and then star of Bethlehem. Yeah, those are other ones that I would encourage, you know, if capable, uh, just, just simply dig them up. Those are ones uh, from a more like natural area perspective, I'm not as worried about, but uh, I'd say in the context like of your own backyard, uh, if they're a nuisance, um, I'm neither of those species are native. And, uh, but I don't think they would require something as drastic as, you know, introducing any kind of chemical treatment. And I believe that DCNR has a fact sheet on at least Star of Bethlehem, maybe also Creeping Buttercup. So just do some quick research online and see what you can find. Um, yeah, it's always good just to get as much information as you can. For those, do you have any specific replacement recommendations? Um, uh, for those, it'd be it'd be the the same thing as the celandine. I would look into what kinds of spring ephemerals are native to your area. I mentioned Virginia bluebells, but uh, uh, even some of the ones that Amy showed earlier, the yellow trout lily, uh, spring beauties. Uh, there's a whole array of violet species that are native. Um, all of those are great replacements. Thank you. Um, someone else mentioned invasive vinca in their um, neighborhood woodlands. Yeah, vinca vinca is really tough um, because it's it's similar to lesser celandine where it'll completely carpet an area, but it is also evergreen, so it has a it has a competitive edge where it'll continue to grow through the winter. Um, that's that's really tough to get rid of without doing some kind of widespread herbicide treatment, which is one, uh, it costs a lot, and two, in, you know, in the highly residential areas, that's not ideal, you know, where people are living, you don't necessarily want to introduce a ton of harsh chemicals to, uh, to a residential area. Um, if, if you're willing to tackle it, uh, I think that's great for you, and there's, you can do it. Um, uh, those things like that just require, you know, sustained work over years and years. There's just not a way to do it like a one and done treatment. You just have to keep at it over long periods of time. I think that is the last question that we have in the chat. So if anyone has any last questions to add in the chat, you're welcome to, or I don't know if folks want to unmute and ask a question, I think that's all right too, because we have a small group here. But otherwise, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Amy and Brian, for being here and doing this very informative presentation. We appreciate it. You're very welcome.